Welcome to Friendship Vallejo. I'm Pastor Justin, and this is the place where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. And, uh, let's jump into the Word of God, uh, beginning a series today in the book of Revelation. And uh, it's in the back of your Bible. I think we're going to have some fun diving into it. And as I began to wrestle with how to introduce the book of Revelation. And so this week, my son and I, my son, my wife, and I, we made slime at home. And uh, this is some of the slime we made. It's messy, it's grimy, it pulls apart all of this. And as I began to think through the book of Revelation, to me, this is what the book of Revelation is like. Did you know slime is really only like four ingredients, right? It's all it is, is it's some water, it's some glue, it's uh, some activator. Like, you know, you make your soul glow, right? That is, <laughs> not that, but some of y'all still got that jerry curl, right? Like, um, <laughs> it looks so bad. I'm kidding. So um, it's, it, it's activator and uh, some shaving cream. And you put that together and you got slime. It's four very simple, very basic ingredients put together. And it makes something really cool, yet something very, very messy. And kids play with it. And it's fun. You just pull it apart. It's fun. You just, it's, 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 it's interesting that this, this cool little gooey thing that kids have fun with is made up of four very simple ingredients put together and just kerned and played with over time. To me, that's the book of Revelation. When you look at Revelation, the book of Revelation is just really five or six ingredients put together. It's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the doctrine hardomology, which is uh, the doctrine of sin, it's the doctrine of the wrath of God, it's the doctrine of salvation, it's the Holy Spirit and the Father and the future put together into one book. Now, isolated, you get the story of Jesus, which is the Gospels. Isolated, you get God in the Old Testament. You get the wrath of God in the Old Testament prophetic books. But isolated, they're all fun. We read the book of Daniel. We read the Gospels. Isolated, it's all interesting. Put together, it's, it's messy. But I think salvation is extremely messy. Um, salvation in and of itself is messy. Put together, it's like, you know, we talk about slime, and it's like probably crazy. Pastor, why are you playing with slime? Um, well, because it's funny because we throw slime to kids, right? Kids play with slime. And we think about the book of Revelation. You just meet Christ, you come to church, you better talk about Revelation. I'm going to go read about the end times because it's so messy that sometimes I think we get so saved that we don't want to confront the messy stuff. It's fun, actually. The book of Revelation, as we study it together over the course of the next 10 weeks, is going to be a lot of fun. Because what it's going to show you is this is the one and only time Jesus told us what the future is like. It's not scary. It's not just the 144,000. It's not the isolated four or five scriptures that people want to pick out. It's not the rumors and war and war and earthquakes. It's not that. Trump is not the epitome of the book of Revelation. Neither is Biden or Obama or Reagan. I mean, all, none of these, Putin, is not the epitome of the book of Revelation. What we're going to see is that Jesus told us about the future. Do you trust it? Are you afraid of it? And there's some places where we have a chance to answer some questions for ourselves. Because if you trust Jesus, Revelation is so much fun. If you don't, it's really scary. I pray we go with the former and not the latter. So let's dive into Revelation today. It's going to come up on the screen. I gave a workbook out. So I put together a workbook. Every letter we're going to study has a particular foundation. So the workbook's in the back. If we're out, I emailed it out this morning. It was emailed out last week. It's on our website. If you go to our blog page on our website, there's a workbook. I also put together a 28-day devotional that you can study the book of Revelation personally and uh, walk through Revelation as well. So I want to go through a couple of things. First of all, what is everything that you need to know about the book of Revelation? It's going to come up on your screen, and uh, let's have some fun. Let's dive into it and see what God has to say to us. So what is every, the big idea of the book of Revelation? Revelation reveals who Jesus is, his power, and his plans. John uses poetry, symbolism, and imagery to describe what will happen when Jesus returns to earth, the ongoing battle between good and evil, and what eternity will be like for Christians and non-Christians. We're going to see five things in Revelation. Number one, in Revelation, for, with that too, let me say this, it's not the book of Revelations. John had one revelation from Jesus, right? So I just want to make it, it's not Revelations, it's Revelation. So anyway. Uh, in Revelation, we see that, number one, Jesus is coming back soon. Um, soon is really pejorative, too. So it's not, God doesn't work on human time. He's working on God's own time. So soon is on Jesus. The prophets believe that Jesus was coming back during their lifetime, and he didn't. And so Jesus is coming back soon. Number two, God and Satan are not equals. I want to really harp on that for a second. Um, we have given Satan way too much credit. 
right? Like the devil made you do it. Why is the devil that close to you? Let that sink in, right? Like, why is it not like, I can't hear God's voice, but the devil made me do it. That's a problem. Pastor, preach more serious on how to hear the voice of God, but the devil made you do it. Why does the devil? No, maybe you did it. Maybe you like it and don't like when God told you no. Literally, hell, so Jesus says when he di- was resurrected from the grave, he had power over death, hell, and the grave. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And the very place where Satan reigns, he was just tired of Satan. So he sent him to a place that God created, Hades. God created hell too. He created is that the place for those that say no to him. He said, literally, I'm creating a place for you. So Satan can only do what God gives him the authority and the access to do. So God and Satan are not equal. Satan literally, Job chapter 2, he goes to God and says, who can I go to? And then God says, have you considered? God and Satan aren't equals. I really want us to delineate that God has all power, not Satan. They're not equal. Number three, God will make everything right in his time and in his way. Not on your time, but in his time. Number four, Jesus is king over everything and everyone. That statement was really cool when Kanye put out a gospel album. But I want us to hold on to the truth that Jesus is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. He's above all in all. This is called, we call it panentheism, that there is one true God. He is in everything because everything comes from God. So that's what we believe in, the panentheistic nature of God. He is in everything because everything comes from God. So he is king over everything, and he is king over everyone, even you, right? We will spend eternity somewhere, and your response to Jesus determines Where? The decision we have to make in this text is where you will spend eternity. And Jesus is going to tell you what eternity is full. So what is, how does Revelation fit into God's big story? So what does this mean in the canon of Scripture, the 66 books of the Bible? Number one, world history, current events and disasters and wars and bad things happen. But, everyone say but. But. God is still in control. Let me be really clear about this. God is not in heaven like, oh! Russia, oh, oh my God, oh, I can't believe the earth is groaning. You know the reason the earth is groaning is because of sin. We have dominion over the earth. And when we took our hands, Adam and Eve, off of the earth and put it on one another, on things we are not supposed to put our hands on, the earth is groaning because we don't take dominion. Your relationship groans because you didn't take dominion. Your job is groaning because you didn't take dominion. God called us to create and cultivate, to have dominion over every living thing. It's groaning. It's rejecting us because we haven't been intentional about it. That's global warming. This is all biblical. That's global warming. That's the ice things. That's the water. That's, that's the flooding, the wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the volcanoes. We didn't take dominion. The earth is now rejecting its, cre- its, its leader. Right? Number two, he may not fix everything initially, but he will fix everything eventually. Once again, Jesus doesn't have to check in with us to get things done. You may tell Jesus to do it by Tuesday. He does it on Wednesday. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. God is on God's own timeline. And Jesus is going to come back to earth to make things right and be with those who follow him. That's the decisions we make. So how does Revelation fit into your story? Well, here's the principle here. When we go through difficult times, Jesus is with us. The fact is that John received the revelation of Jesus Christ because in a, war, in a difficult moment for him, Jesus is with him. Number two, Jesus' power is bigger than our problems because my hope does not come from my circumstances, but my connection to Jesus. Your hope does not come, from, it's not circumstantial, it's continual, it's in Jesus. And lastly, when you understand there's more to life than what you experience on earth, you realize that death is not the end, death changes how you live. When we know what the future holds, it changes how you live in the present. Everybody grab your Bibles. Go to Revelation chapter 22. You can keep your seats. I want you to give you the main scripture. Sorry, Revelation 21. I want to give you the main scripture for this whole series where you will see that everything we do in the book of Revelation is going to point towards this one verse in Revelation chapter 21. When you get to Revelation 21, go down to verse number 3. Thank you to everybody tuned in online. The Bible app notes are coming in the comments too. So if you want the Bible app, you can go Bible app and you'll be able to follow along with us. Revelation 21, verse number 3. It says these words. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is important because the entirety of Scripture is God trying to dwell with his people. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, and God finally was able to dwell with his people. The challenge we have as we go into this text is are you going to be in the number that knees are bowed and eyes are up aligned to the Lord, or are you going to be the one, one of the ones that Jesus does not bring with him when he comes back? I would much rather be knee bent and body bowed in front of the presence of God than worry about the opinions of people and still be here after Jesus has gone back to glory. Revelation is going to ask us those questions. So let's dive into it. Let me give you some history of the text, and then I will get to the first three verses and we'll be out of here very shortly. So when we get into this study, we're going to study the seven churches in Asia Minor, really making up modern-day Turkey. Each church has its own unique storyline. The book of Revelation is the consummation in the divine program of redemption of the Lord Jesus and is brought to fruition, and the holy name of God is vindicated before all creation. And while there are numerous prophecies of this in the epistles and the gospels, Revelation is the only New Testament book where we hear directly from Jesus about the future. It centers on visions and symbols of the resurrected Christ. And I want to speak to these visions and symbols. The same way today, if we were to talk about cars, there's a certain way we talk about cars. There's a reason why there are certain things. So, for example, they did not have electricity back in the time where John was exiled in Patmos, right? So there's a reason why John is talking about seven golden lampstands. We're talking about lights. They're talking about lampstands. I want us to understand context. There's a certain language that goes with the culture. So to understand this book, we have to understand the culture of that time. So let's, let's get to the author of the book. So who wrote the book of Revelation? We believe it was John the Apostle who wrote this in AD 95. Now, John was exiled. I'm going to put a picture up of AI. Thank you. Uh, John was exiled on an island called Patmos. So I put this in artificial intelligence to try to get a picture. So here's the thing. I'm going to show you what Patmos looks like today in a second, but I want you to see what Patmos looks like probably then. Patmos was not beautiful at the time John was there. Patmos was a, in the middle of the Aegean Sea, about seven miles off the coast of, um, of, 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 of modern-day of modern Turkey, old Asia Minor. And uh, so it was off the coast, and it was, vol- it was a volcanic landscape. It was used as a prison colony for Rome. So John was exiled because of his preaching. Titus Flavius Dominitan did not like what John was preaching. He was a threat to his reign. And so what he did was he exiled him to Patmos. He literally put him in prison. And what they would do is you would sell everything you have, and you live off that for the rest of your life, exiled. There's no way in and out unless the governor comes and gets you. That's what John happened. So that's what, uh, so he, we believe this is John hearing Jesus, but looking at Ephesus, and that would have been seven miles away. So I want to put up on the screen what Patmos looks like today. Make sure the, the volume is muted. But there's a video of what Patmos looks like today. So we believe this is where John, we call this the, the cave of the apocalypse, where this is where John would have looked out, and this is what he would have seen. So there's other little islands, but far, far off, you see way in the corner was Ephesus, and that was the center of the city, the center of the community. But now it's a bustling space. People live there. They got all these different stuffs there. But that's what John's vision would have had. So this is why it's so powerful because what John was looking at was nothing but landscape, exiled in prison. And so he only could hear from Jesus. So you can take it down. I want you to see what that looks like because here's the power of this. So he lost everything. And so now because he lost everything, here's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. During John's trip to Patmos, a big storm came up on the GNC. While John was praying, a wave brought a man back on a boat. And this miracle gave John a chance to preach the gospel. So when John gets to Patmos, the Roman governor, Laurentius, sets him free, and Myron, his brother-in-law, offers to ha- for him to stay in his house. And because of that, John plants a church on Patmos. Then what happens is Myron's son, Apollonides, is possessed by the devil, which leads to the conversion of people in Myron's family. This became an opportunity where even though John was exiled to Patmos, John took a time in one year to plant a church, heal someone who was full of Satan, and begin to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. John went there with practically nothing. He would die very shortly if he had no help. But what God did was allow a storm to come, and because John preached the gospel, he had everything he needed while he was on the island. 
One year later, Scripture tells us that in AD 96, John was set free because Flavidus Dominican died until so he was set free. So John was able then to go back to the churches he wrote these letters to. It's absolutely wonderful history. So today, the Cave of the Apocalypse in Patmos is a museum, and it's hosted. It's simply seven meters long and six meters wide. All it was, that's where John rested his head to hear the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what was Revelation written to? The screens can come up on your screen. You'll see this. It was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And what you'll see here is modern-day Turkey. Um, so John speaks them in a counterclockwise manner. So you can see here, the island of Patmos would have been a little bit off the Aegean Sea, closer to Athens. And so you see the, he was in the island of Patmos. He could see Ephesus, right? So that way, so what he wrote the letters, they wrote them in a counterclockwise manner. So that's where he started with Ephesus. And as we read them, you'll see Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thy Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And those seven letters were then written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And these, it's important because we see here that every single church had a different background. So, for example, there's a reason why some churches, he'll, Jesus will address himself as, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. To others, I'm the first and the last. To others, I'm the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Jesus addresses them differently because every community was different. You can bring it down. Every community was different. There were some that had Gentiles. They represented Turkey, represented Asia Minor. Every church had issues. And there's a reason why God then says something different to each one of them. To one church, he tells them, you're lukewarm. Pff, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now the church, he tells them you lost your first love. And then to another church, he tells them this is the time of your open door. God has opened doors for you. Like every single one of these messages are full of love. Every single message is full of care. And it's a signature to every church of Jesus' love for them as prophetic literature. So what does that mean, Pastor Justin? So here's what I want us to understand about prophecy, right? So prophetic literature has to be understood like this. It meant something in that time, and it means something today, right? So if we go back to the Old Testament, just to give some prophecy, right? So if we go to Isaiah chapter 7, I believe it was, and we get the prophecy of Jesus. Now unto us a child is born, and we will call him Emmanuel, the government be upon his shoulders, right? All of that, that great prophecy, the context, it meant something then. Us reading it backwards know that Isaiah 7 was about Jesus. At the time... They didn't know about a Messiah. It was the king of Persia's baby, and they were going into a war, and they were wondering whether or not they were going to win the war. And the way they were going to win the war is the king can't die because the king had seed that he had not slept with his wife yet. So when he does, the wife is going to bear a child. Now unto us, a son is given, right? So it meant something to them in that time. We know looking backwards, it was prophesying Jesus. Prophecy means something in the moment, and it prepares you for the future, the same thing, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon his shoulders, and with his stripes we are healed. We know looking backwards, that was Jesus. At the time, it was war. So it meant something in that time. You're going to be okay. It means something. Whenever God sends a prophet or begins to reveal the future to you, what Jesus is doing is he's trusting you to be conformed to his image. This is what's going to happen. Don't miss it. Right? So I want you to understand that I'm going to send you a child and you're going to win the war, but the battle is not over. Right? There's something much bigger, Israel, I need you to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. So as we read the prophetic literature, we have to understand the context of the prophetic literature, and then we can understand how God is using us to understand it. So the context of, 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 of this time is that the people of that time, was, it was Greece and Rome were the superpowers. So therefore, Rome had imposed a heavy taxation on their people, and there were military garrisons everywhere. So think about the church. The church internally is fractured. Jews don't like Gentiles. They're rampant with sin. Idolatry is all around them. You got the temple built to sex, the temple built to fertility, the temple built to harvest. You got all these temples. You got all these red light districts. You have taxation from Rome. You have military bases everywhere you go. And these churches were under heavy Roman persecution. They're embroiled with sin. And the larger culture is rampant with idolatry. It sounds like modern-day America. Wars and rumors of war, sex everywhere, idols everywhere, and people that go to church can't stand each other. It sounds like today. So what's the purpose? He writes these books. Jesus pauses. Imagine this. How serious does Jesus take his church? He allows his beloved to be exiled on an island, and he comes down from heaven and talks directly to him about seven churches. How much does Jesus love you? He assigns pastors and prophets and apostles 
to be the shepherds of your soul to hear directly. I take this job so serious because my responsibility in my prayer time is to hear directly from Jesus about you. So no, I don't read your journal, but I can tell you what happened on the 37th page of your journal last Tuesday. No, I don't know, because I've been with the Lord. John was with the Lord. This is why prophecy is so important. The purpose was to tell the churches and believers that if you are trying to live a righteous life, this is how to do it. It also serves for all of us in this room to correct us who are living poorly and warn you that if you are doing things to corrupt the presence of God in his church, you don't have to face any human's wrath. You'll face the wrath of Jesus. So the revelation of Jesus has a lot of theology, and I want to give you two major theological principles that we're going to see in the book of, uh, book of Revelation. Um, if you guys can't tell, I teach theology, so I love this stuff. So I like, I'm so like, oh my God, this is so much fun. So I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. So there's two major doctrines of theology we see in this book. Number one, we see the doctrine of Christology, ology, the study of Christ, the study of Christ, Christology. There's no clearer book in scripture that gives us information on the personal work of Jesus. So here's five motifs of Christology in the book of Revelation. Number one, we get that Jesus is the Son of Man. Revelation 1, 13 um, through 16, we get that Jesus is the Lamb of God. We get that Jesus is the conquering king. Once again, I want you to understand, this is not someone telling us who Jesus is. This is Jesus telling us who he is, right? He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Let me say this about Alpha and Omega. It's not just that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's saying, I'm Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Sigma, right? I am every single thing in between. I'm also the beginning and the end. I'm everything in the middle as well. Um, I'm the first and the last. I'm the faithful witness. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. I'm the one riding on the white horse. Revelation 19 and 11. We're going to preach a relation 19, the whole hallelujah, salvation, and glory. It is not what you think. It's actually, it was a really difficult moment where they were overcoming Satan, but we'll unpack that later this month. These motifs show us something so powerful, that Jesus is not, is, 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 is multifaceted. Jesus' nature and his role plays a major role in the cosmic battle between good and evil. Here's our issue. You can bring it down. Here's our issue. We are trying to fight good and evil without realizing that Jesus already won. We'll back it up again. So you calling your friends or your colleagues evil, Jesus already won. I'm going to say it again because I, I can get up here and hoop holler and squall about houses and cars. If you don't trust the truth, that you don't have to fight anything that Jesus won. And don't waste your energy on interpersonal conflict. The battle between good and evil goes beyond a weird coworker. Like, God in heaven, like, oh, my God, I created the sun, moon, and stars, but I didn't know they were going to put an exclamation point in an email. Are you serious? Like, I created everything. Ugh, the sun, the moon, the stars are mine. But, like, they looked at you funny. Ugh, I better stop everything because they looked at you weird. No, the battle between good and evil has been won by Jesus. Do you trust that he's called you good? Ah, John Walford, that great theologian, says this. I'm not going to go there. John Walford says this. If for no other reason... This book is important as the final chapter of Scripture because it's the self-disclosure of God through Jesus Christ so you know what Christ is like after the ascension. I am trying to get us ready so that if Jesus comes, you aren't scared and you know it's him. The reason we are so confused of like, is the Antichrist back? Is Jesus back? No, because you haven't read Revelation. Jesus tells you what he looks like. Like, if I were to describe myself, I'd be like, oh, I'm this extremely dapper 6'5 young man who can school anybody in a game of basketball. Um, I said what I said. I can school anybody in a game of basketball. He's extremely, extremely handsome, and his wife absolutely adores him, and his son is going to be even better. And he's going to be, like, if I were to describe myself, that's how, I, I wouldn't literally say that, but I, I would describe myself. Jesus is in the book of Revelation. He's literally telling you, when I come back, this is what to look for. I have, I have, I have feet like bronze. I have hair like lambswool. He literally is describing himself. 
And when I come back, this is what I'm going to do. And if you've said yes to me, you don't have to worry because you're in the number where it won't happen to. I hope you hear me today. So we get this theology, this Christology. And the second major doctrine that I want to unpack that you will see in every single letter is the doctrine of God's wrath and doctrine of God's ultimate justice. Now, let me say this. I believe as Christians, you can come down for a second, take it down for a second. I believe as Christians, we've gotten so domesticated and like soft. Let me say this. We don't talk about hell or God's wrath or punishment because we want to love, 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 love. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, love, right? Frankly, scripture is very clear um, that the wrath of God is going to happen. But the reason you are exempt from the wrath is because you trust his love. If you want to see the wrath of God, Look at the crucifixion. James Cone, in his work, Cross the Lynching Tree, suggested that every single one of us name was written on a piece of flesh that was ripped out of Jesus' body. How hard and terrible was your sin? It was ripped from his body. Your name. So the wrath of God was taken out on his son. He literally took all of his anger And it took his son three and a half hours to deal with your sin. God's love brings wrath. The death of Jesus is the ultimate expression of the love of Jesus and the ultimate expression of the wrath of God. He loves us so much that he literally killed his own child and watched him die so that you don't have to. Glory be to the Son of God. And let me say this very clearly with that too. My friends in real estate tell me that you only pay for something what you think it's worth. So if you're wondering how much you're worth, when the world wanted to kill you, Jesus said, take my life. If that's not enough for you to serve him, if that's not enough for you to give, if that's not enough for you to read your Bible, I don't know what else he can do. Literally, when the world said the, the, the wages of your sin is death, But the gift, do you see that? The gift of God is eternal life. So this book is very clear about the love of God and the wrath of God. Let me show you. It's going to come up on the screen. There's so much on the wrath of God. First of all, we're going to see the seal, the trumpet, and the bold judgments. Revelation chapter 6, that God's wrath escalates in intensity. He always gives you a chance to turn. And when you don't, it only gets worse. It's shown in natural disasters and catastrophes like earthquakes and plagues and fire. In Revelation chapter 8, punishment of the wicked as a response. Let me say this about wicked. You don't choose who's wicked. You don't choose wicked. Matter of fact, it takes one to know one. Okay. Anyway, so um, there's wrath against false worship. God's wrath is directed at those who engage in false worship. Revelation 14 and 19, uh, 14 and 9, there's a f- final judgment in the lake of fire. The ultimate manifestation of God's wrath is where the, the, the wicked, those who said no to Jesus, are cast in the eternal lake of fire, signifying eternal separation from God. Jesus even has a parable, I believe it's in Mark chapter 9 or Mark chapter 4, um, where he literally hears from a man who is screaming in the lake of fire. Um, it's a scary place to be. There's demons that are unleashed. God's wrath is depicted through a release of demonic forces who wreak havoc on the earth. There's a great day of wrath where it literally says there is a day where it's going to happen. There's a final destruction of Babylon, Revelation 18. There's some others. There's the great tribulation. There's the battles. There's a serpent. There's a great harlot. There are minions of, that align with Satan that will come into the earth and go into eternal punishment to ensure the final and complete judgment. Oh, my God. Here's why you have nothing to worry about. I want to take the weight off. Well, I hope you don't. The goal is to be like Jesus, to be conformed to his image. Acts chapter 16, the Christ, they were first called Christians at Antioch. The word Christians there is literally a slang term, little Christ. They were making fun of them because they said, quote, you look too much like Jesus, you stupid little Christians. I hope that the world insults us and calls us Christians. Because I'm conf- I look so much like Jesus that you want to say, I look like my, my father. The word, the book of Revelation, the reason of Revelation is used so much for fear-mongering, we want to talk about our, because really, we're scared, a lot of us are scared of death 
and hell. We used to sing old songs. I don't know if y'all sang it, but I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to hell. We sit here on mourners' benches just as I am until somebody admits they're not going to hell. Let me say this. The book of Revelation is more about God's love for us than it is about God's hatred towards his children. If you are worried about death, hell, and the grave, the challenge isn't whether or not Jesus loves you in Revelation. The challenge is, have you said yes to him? Because if you said yes to him, let me tell you where you're going. Eternity. I want to worship with you for eternity. If you said no, this book is very scary. This Keeping it chewable, this book is about the personal work of Jesus. He's literally telling you what he's doing. This book is literally otherworldly. So is Christ coming back soon? I don't know. Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? Is it next month? I don't know. Jesus tells us no man knows the hour. He literally, read, if you read later in the book of Revelation, he says, unseal the book, but seal the day. Revelation 22, unseal the book, John, but keep the day sealed. I, no man knows the hour because maybe our problem is we want to know the time and day so we can sin up until that one day. Oh, I mean, you want to get your groove back like Stella, don't you? I mean, you just want to, you want to, you want to drop it like it's hot, twerk on it like, you want to do all you want to do. Until the day before Jesus comes back, Jesus, I love you. Maybe we walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've received daily. Maybe the problem is that we're so concerned when he comes back that we don't live like he is here. Have you said yes to Jesus? Great. Revelation is your future. You have nothing to worry about. You're going to be with him for eternity. Every knee is going to bow. You're going to live your life in alignment with the work and the will of Jesus. Have you not said yes to Jesus? Well, let me tell you, this also reveals your future. There will be an antichrist. There is damnation to hell and eternal separation from Jesus. The book of Revelation is significant because these events will soon take place. Not on your time, but on God's time. That's Revelation. So let's look at Revelation verses 1 through 3. Keep your seats. And I just want to look at this and we'll get ready to go and take communion together. And here's the first three verses. I'm telling you this. I was so excited this morning. I got up. My wife was like, why? I was up at like 5 a.m. I was like, Christmas for me. She's like, why are you up so early? I said, I have never preached Revelation straight. Heaven is going to open, church. I've been on my face for you, on my face for us. I truly believe that God's going to show us something wonderful about himself if you're willing to receive it. Revelation chapter 1. Let's see the word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, because the time is near. Let's break this down. I'm out of your way. Number one, verse number one, the word apocalypse, apocalypsos Christus, the revelation of Jesus, the disclosure of Jesus. Some of your Bibles are going to say the revelation of John. The first three words literally in the Greek are the revelation of the person, Jesus Christ. It just means the disclosing of Jesus. So the Gospels give us the story of firsthand accounts with Jesus, the, what Jesus did, he paid for sin. We get the Beatitudes, the commissioning of the disciples, upper room. But then that's great information. But then we get something else in Revelation. This is the first time we get the unveiling of what is still yet to come. This is the guarantee of what you will see those who said yes to Jesus. So how did God give it to us? Verse number two, God through Christ sent and communicated to us by his angel. Now, what angel? I don't know. The simple answer is we don't know. And here's what I want to tell you too, church. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who gave it to John. The fact is Jesus showed up with John and gave him his word. So here's what John says. So it doesn't matter who gave it to me. What's more important is the B clause of verse number two. He says, I am a servant. I'm an apostle of Jesus. I was given a message to communicate. He says, I am making myself a servant of Jesus Christ. The word apostle literally means and translates to be a willing indentured bond servant. John is saying, I have made myself a slave to Jesus. 
See, an apostle is a bondservant to Jesus, that he's recognizing that I'm hearing the word of God because Jesus is my master and I am not my own master. Because the gospel church is not about your kingdom, not about your empire, not about your plans, not about your goals, not about your dreams. The Bible is not the extension of a self-help book. The Bible, the gospel is about for a maturing Christian who understands that my life is about serving a savior that bought my life with a price that I I can never pay. I am willing to honor him because he brought me out from hell and redeemed me and stole my ticket to hell from me. So John says, I will serve Jesus. I'm willingly enslaving myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question to you, church, is are you a servant of Christ or are you trying to be Christ's master? Does Jesus have to check in with you for the sun to go up in the morning? Does Jesus have to check in with you for the weather today? Does Jesus have to come to you and check in for how your friends are going to be? Or are you saying, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'll follow. If you want me to go up, I'll go up. If you want me to go down, I'll go down. If it makes me stretch, I'll stretch Jesus. There's all joy in you, and I choose to bear the fruits of the Spirit and be uncomfortable with the fruits of the flesh because I'm a willing, indentured bondservant to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Look what he says. The way we do this John says, is through testimony. Yes, sir. Let me talk about testimony time. You know what I can't stand? What can't you stand, Pastor Justin? I can't stand weird testimony services. Like, if I call the testimony service right now, all of a sudden, no matter how old or young you are, I do the same thing. We get all King Jamesy. You ever notice that? Like, these thou's, all of a sudden, the potentate giving honor to God who's out of my life. Giving all this into the potentate. I don't even know where the potentate is. Have y'all ever found the potentate? But the potentate is showing up and to the pastor, the angel of this church, the visionary for this vehicle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you. In the name of the one. I mean, we get all these and thou in 1920. I don't get what the word testimony time is not what testimony means. We've made testimony service about spilling your guts. Telling how bad your life was and how terrible life is. Not what Jesus did. It's how terrible you are, but like you got a new job. That's not, that testimony time is so much more than that. Testimony time, the word testimony there, the best way to explain it is what we see in court. If you're ever a witness in a court of law, you are telling them three things. Number one, I am telling you the truth of what I've seen. I'm telling you the truth of what I've heard. And I'm telling you the truth of what I know. Go to 1 John 101. That's giving a testimony. So I want to reframe how we see testimony time. Because here's the other thing I want to say about testimony times. I can't stand when we have testimony time and you are worried about judgment from people on the truth that Jesus did in your life. What are they going to say? Oh, my God. What are they going to think about me? What are people going to say? I don't know. It's your story. I never forget. I never forget. I was pastoring my first church for five, no, six, I passed for six years. On my fifth year, I got in my church. I was so excited because I shared a status. And I, my fifth year, had not cut myself for three years. Church is like, oh, praise the Lord. Because I used to cut myself. That's the way I punished myself. I would cut myself. I have cuts all over my arm, my legs. It's my story. It's my truth. I can't do anything about it. I cut myself. And then one of my deacons was like, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've been here five years. That means you were cutting yourself for two years while you were pastoring? Yes. Y'all drove me to harm myself. In my first church, straight up. Yep, I harmed myself for two years. Then the Lord in 2017 put down the knife. I no longer cut myself. And they were like, well, pastor, don't tell that story. Because, like, that makes you look weak. And you're supposed to be strong. Don't get weird. Because last year, the second Sunday here, got up here with a shirt that said Jesus in therapy. I shared my story. How Pastor Justin, Justin Rizal Lester, has attempted suicide twice. Wrote a whole book on it. Have podcasts. Have videos out about it. I've done talks about it. I've attempted suicide twice. Second time, almost died. I t- cut myself so bad after a church service. I left a church service and tried to kill myself and almost did it. I have a story to tell. And after church, Pastor, I get it. That's your story. Here. But... You know, you don't want people to think you're weak. No, I'm strong. You know why? Because I was broken, and now I'm here. I wish I had a witness in here. And for some reason, so I'm talking to every person who got something in your past. I thank God for your testimony, because if it had not been, I wish I had some folk in here. For the Lord who was on your side, I wish I had a witness in this Anglican church. I 
I've got a testimony about what I've seen. I wish I had a witness. What I've heard, and now you can't make me doubt him. I wish I had. I know too much about him. What the Lord, am I talking to anybody in the building who's got a testimony on the inside that the Lord picked me up, the Lord turned me around, the Lord set my feet, and if it had not been for the Lord on my side. So don't shut up about your testimony. No testimony is too ugly, it's your story. No testimony is too dirty, it's your story. Because the only reason you made it is Jesus, only Jesus. And we don't shout enough about Jesus. We don't scream enough about Jesus. But if it had not been for the Lord who did that thing, you'd be six feet under. Your marriage would be over. You'd be lost your mind. You'd be cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But I wish I had but 18 folk in the building who could put a nickel in the meter and talk right there and say, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. Hallelujah. 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 I've been with the Lord. I've been broken, but now I'm healed. I wish I had a witness in this Anglican church. I said, I've been broken, but now I'm healed. Woo! I said, I've been broken, but now, woo, now I'm healed. And can't nobody, I don't feel, do me like Jesus. Can't nobody. Hey, do me like, am I talking to anybody in the building who can help me preach this sermon? Put your mind on rewind and give him glory for what he's done. So I am a living testimony. Should have been dead and gone. I wish. But the Lord let me live on. Go ahead, high five somebody who look like they too bougie to give God glory and say, I'm a testimony. I'm a testimony. You ain't got to shout for me. I'll shout by myself because I am a living testimony. Should have been dead and gone. Oh, but the Lord let me live on. Say it. Somebody just had a flashback. I wish I had somebody. I said, somebody just had a flashback. I wish, I said, somebody just had a flashback. If it had not been for the Lord who kept me, if it had not been for the Lord who sustained me, if it had not been for the Lord, so I'm going to praise him by myself because I know where I've been, but I know who God is. Your testimony is you telling the truth on Jesus. I wish I had a witness. No, no, no. I said your testimony is you telling the truth on Jesus. I love, Grandma, it was a stormy Monday, but Tuesdays were just as bad. Wednesdays were worse. Thursdays were all so sad. The eagle flew on Friday, and Saturday I went out to play. But on Sunday morning, I got a testimony to tell. I'm going to kneel down and pray because my soul has been changed. My body has been washed. My mind has been renewed because of Jesus. Only Jesus. John says, I got a testimony. You can't shut me up. I got a testimony. I can't stand church folk. It don't take all that. If you only knew. Uh, I'm going to say it again. I can't stand bougie church folk. It don't take all that. If you only knew. It takes more than this. Because I ain't got 10,000 tongues. But if I had, I wish I had some crazy praises. If I had 10,000 tongues, I, am I talking to anybody in the building who can help me preach this sermon? Make your neighbor uncomfortable and open up your mouth and shout with a voice of triumph and joy that God has kept me. Yeah. 
I've been, I've been changed, and I didn't do it myself. I've been blessed, and, and, and I didn't do it myself. I know who I was before Jesus, but I'm glad at who I am now that I know Jesus. Hmm. Let me say this. Let me say, and so here's what testimony does, John says. Your testimony convicts you. John says, because Jesus brought me from death to life, he gave me a conscience. Oh, y'all were just shouting. Where are you? I said, he gave you a conscience. Now I'm aware of my sin. And I don't want to do it again. I, I'm aware of how prideful, how arrogant, how full of myself I was without Jesus. And I never want to know a day where Jesus isn't in it. A lot of us have good stories. We don't have a testimony. John says, nobody can take your testimony from you. Because you are an eyewitness. Glory to the Lamb of God, to Jesus. So John says, if you read this book, you got the truth on Jesus. So let me ask you a question, church. Do you trust the truth about Jesus? Or is your testimony about spilling your guts? When's the last time you told the truth on Jesus to people who don't know Jesus? Your testimony time is telling the truth on Jesus. Verse 3 ends it, and he says it like this. Blessed is the one who reads these prophecies. Blessed are those who hear it and take heart to it. He ends this statement by telling us this simple phrase. Read the word of God, obey the word of God, and you'll be blessed. It's amazing. This text, this text was written. I'm good. This text was written, and he says here, he who reads it, it's singular. It's singular. And what he's saying here is that I'm sending you this note to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And as you read this note at the seven churches in Asia Minor, the person who reads it is going to be blessed. Remember, they're under Roman persecution. They're killing Christians left and right. And he says if you trust God's word, he'll make sure you have life. That's why I am unafraid every Sunday to preach this book black and white. Because I know that no matter what happens, the one who reads the scroll is blessed. That's why I'm careful about who gets behind this desk to share the gospel. Because if your ego is up here and not the gospel, it's not the people who are cursed. It's his wrath on you. Church, God has given you his word. Be blessed when you trust it. He says singularly, who reads it. Secondly, who hears it. That's plural. He says, I want the people to hear it. But then the way to feel the blessing of the text is not just to hear it, but you must obey it. The word obedience in that text is written in the present continual. And he says us to us, church, obedience is not a one-time thing. Obedience is continual. Let me say it again. Obedience is not a one-time thing. It's daily. It's like loving your children, loving your spouse. You choose. You don't fall in love. You don't like, oh, I'm loved. No, you, you choose to love. Choosing to love your children, your spouse, is a daily, continual thing. Same thing for Jesus. Obedience is not a one-time thing. It's continual. And it shows Jesus that I am ready that if you came right now, if you came in 20 years, I am not worried about when. I'm just happy I know who. So what, Pastor Justin? Here's the principles I'll give you today. This whole text teaches us one big statement. Our life is not our own. We were bought with a price. We are slaves to a master, a good and kind master. Our life is not ours. We are to live for his glory and honor, not for our kingdom and our empire. Let me put it for you so you can say this to yourself. I want you to own this statement. You can say it to yourself weekly, daily, whatever it is. It's been something I've been saying ever since I wrote this sermon. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. 
I'm a servant to a master, a good and kind master. My life belongs to him, not to me. And I'm here to live for his glory and for his honor, not to build my own in kingdom and my own empire. Jesus establishes that he has authority. So here's my challenge. You can read it, believe it, and live. Do you really trust the truth about Jesus? That he loves you no matter what? That he cares for you no matter what? That he accepts you for no matter who you are? are you com- is Jesus more committed to you than you are committed to him? I love you, Jesus. I will never give up on Jesus. This is a relation. Jesus loves you so much, he gives you a picture of the future. And so if you're living outside of the will of God, you're living outside of God's best for you. It doesn't matter how much, like you never notice how much we twist sin. It doesn't matter how much you're outside the will of God. When you're outside the will of God, you're outside the will of God. And some of you, no, you're not doing some crazy things, but you've committed adultery with your job. You're sleeping with your to-do list more than you're sleeping with your spouse. You've committed fits of rage with people in your family and called it giving a piece of your mind. No, you are committing a f- fruit of the flesh. That is outside of the will of God. But Pastor Justin, Pastor Justin, hold on now, hold on now. Like, you don't know what they had to know. I am not like them. Whatever your them is. I ain't them. Pastor Justin, I'm not, one of, I'm not on the street corner. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. No, you're worse because you know better. It's, it's one thing to start messed up and find your way. That's mercy. It's another thing to be in church every single Sunday, read the word of God, know the Lord, and still choose to do things that are outside the will of God. That's another level of demonic. No, I'm going to stand flat-footed and preach this gospel. It is one thing to be in church every Sunday, read the word of God, know the Lord, and still choose to do things that are outside the will of God. That is not okay because you know better. And there's a different standard for those of us who know Jesus. My sister, when she was in uh, elementary school, I was in high school, she came home one day during the summer break, and I was babysitting my little sister before my parents got home. Sister said a cuss word in front of my mom, right? Mom said, ooh, Justin, go get my belt. So I started crying. Oh, no, I want a whipping. I'm like, ooh, she going to get it, right? Because I ain't got a whipping in a long time. I felt so proud of myself. I ain't got a whipping for a long time at that time. I was like, my sister going to get it. I get that belt. I bring it to my mama. Because you know when, like, I had to get whippings, I didn't know where her belts were. But my sister got a whipping, I knew exactly where the belts were, right? So I ran, got that belt, brought it to my mama. Mama said, Camille, back up. Justin, come here. I said, wait. Wait a minute. Why am I getting the whipping? She said, Justin, where, Camille, where did you learn that word from? My brother, Camille doesn't know better. You know better. There's a different standard, church, when you know better. And if I'm going to pastor and shepherd us, you know better. And there's certain things you don't do because you know better. Because you've been loved. Because you've been corrected. Because you've been given a conscience because you've been given grace and because you realize that life is worth the living because he lives. It wasn't something that gave, it was someone. So you don't get a second chance. He's not the God of a second chance. He gives you a first chance at a brand new life. And so often I hear, Pastor Justin, but if we could just get back to where we were, if I could get back to where I was, if we can just go back, go back, go back. Can I tell you something? Let's unpack that. The good old days are the gone old days. Because where you were got you to where you are. Do you really want to go back to that? Do you really want to go back and make the same mistakes? Do you really want to go back and do this? No. Here's the thing. Jesus is coming. So we can go back to Egypt if you want to and be under our oppressors. We can go back to 700 years of silence from Jesus. We can go back to us killing Jesus or we can get ready for his coming. Because let me tell you what's going to happen when he comes. Well, let me tell you what he said. Jesus said he's going to wipe away every tear. 
He's going to take away all cancer. He's going to address all ills. He's going to remove all injustice. He's going to take all your pain. He's going to heal your self-esteem. He's going to remove all depression. He's going to take away your need for fame and fortune. He's going to wipe away every single one of your tears. And you won't be worried about your profit and loss statement. You won't be worried about your social media statuses. You'll be paying so much attention to him because when you see him as he is, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, above the earth, in the earth, and under the earth. Are you going to wait till he comes back to get ready? Or will you be ready today? So my question, church, is what is it going to take for you to recalibrate your life to be a little bit more about Jesus and a little bit less about yourself? God doesn't give you a second chance. He gives you a first chance at a new life. And how do we know this? Well, Jesus thought we'd forget it. He thought we'd forget what love looked like. He thought we'd forget what correction looks like. He thought we'd forget what a conscience looks like. So he said, you know what? So you don't forget. I'm going to do something messy with you. Not revelation. This is, this is what he did. He, he took bread. He says, there's nothing that can happen in your life that can break you because I've been broken so you don't have to be. Oh, hallelujah. He took bread and said, this is the worst it'll ever be. Trust me and you'll never experience this. I'm glad for the broken body of Jesus who was broken so I can be healed. Do you trust the truth? Then not just that, but then they took wine and he, he poured it. And he said, this cup will be a new testament in my blood because not only did I break my body for you, but then I allowed the world to plunge, plunge me for my blood of your arrogance, the blood against your conscience, the blood against your pride would pool up. And he said, drink it because as you drink this, I'll redeem you. Do you trust the truth? what Jesus has told you about himself. Revelation is a chance for you to encounter him. Have you said yes to him? Nothing is ever going to break you. Have you said yes to him? You are redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed and saved your life. Do you trust the truth today? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. As we get ready for communion, Reverend Rome can come forward. I want you to ask this Holy Spirit one question. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me?